so welcome everybody to today's seminar uh, it's a great pleasure to have uh, the speaker professor yerik kafri from uh, technion israel institute of technology uh, haifa israel so this seminar uh, webinar series on statistical mechanics is being organized through the visitor associates and students program at the snbos national, national center for basic sciences kolkata uh, professor yerik kafri is the lido chair in solid state physics at the technion uh, his research is focused on statistical mechanics and its applications concerning systems which are far from equilibrium and which often play display striking and dynamical and collective behaviors which are usually not observed in equilibrium so his research interest spans a wide range of topics uh, like non equilibrium non equilibrium fluctuations molecular motors translocation of polymers conformations of dna molecules chemotaxis of bacteria target location by proteins physics of vortices etc and uh, recently he has been working on active matter systems and driven diffusive systems indeed uh, he has contributed immensely in problems of characterizing large scale structures dynamical phase transitions and large deviations in such systems and especially to the students who are present here so here he is an excellent teacher indeed the students who have attended the lectures in some of the recent schools already know this so uh, students please uh, feel free to ask questions uh, whenever you think you do not understand or uh, have any doubts so now i would like to invite yari to deliver his talk yari please okay thank you very much for the very kind introduction and it's a pleasure to uh, talk to see some old friends and uh, again i can't see the faces so please stop me whenever you feel you have a question so today i'm going to talk about the long range influence of disorder on active systems uh, this is work that was done by a host of people uh, and uh, specifically people in the technion and outside the technion and i've highlighted uh, the two works that i'm going to focus about which you can find the references below and the authors there are Idan Bendo who is a PhD student and who's graduating soon at Technion Sungan Ru which is a, who is a postdoc here and Julian Tayo uh, from Paris and Meran Cardo uh, from uh, Boston okay so uh, so before I tell you about the influence of disorder, I want to introduce active systems. I'm, I'm sure that many of you have heard about them, but just to be safe, I'll give a very brief introduction. So active systems are a class of non-equilibrium systems, which each part, where each particle consumes and dissipates energy in order to generate motion. So in contrast to, uh, uh, to driving a system, for example, through the boundaries by a chemical potential, uh, difference here each microscopic degree of freedom is consuming energy and dissipating in, it into the environment in order to self-propel itself so there are many motivations for studying active systems uh, the first ones were actually biological and i'm giving a simple example here of e coli bacteria so E. coli bacteria uh, are about a micron in size, and what I'm showing you is a really old movie from the Howard Berg lab. And if you track the, the E. coli bacteria, you notice that their motion is roughly such that they move in straight lines for about a second. And once every second they stop, choose a new direction, and move in a new direction, and that's called a tumble. So this motion of running, choosing a new direction, etc is called run and tumble motion so these are again e coli they've had a, a meal they're using uh, the food that they consume from the environment in order to self-propel some of themselves and each uh, degree of freedom which is the e coli bacteria is a, an out of equilibrium component uh, after it was, became clear that active systems display a host of non-trivial phenomena that you can't find in equilibrium systems, people started developing a host of uh, uh, systems which are artificial active systems. And here I'm showing again a very old example from the Dave Pine group of self-propelled colloids. So these are again about a micron inside. They're hematite 
uh, colloids, so it's a mixture of iron and oxygen, and they're covered with plastic, and there's one tip, you can see it here, which is exposed to the solution, which is hydrogen peroxide. And what I want to stress here, and that, that I wanted to stress also before, but didn't, is that these particles have a polarity. They're not spherical sym symmetric. You know, if I go back, if you look at an E. coli, it's clear that it has a direction in which it's moving. You can look at it and see its polarity. And similarly, these colloids have a polarity. So what happens at this tip is that when you shine UV light on the solution, there's a chemical reaction happening at the tip, and these, this chemical reaction starts to self-propel the colloids. So if I run the movie, initially the, uh, the UV light is off, they're just doing Brownian motion, and you turn the light off, and you see that they start to self-propel themselves. The direction, of course, because of noise, is a bit random. So the direction diffuses about, and that's why people typically refer to this, these kinds of particles as active Brownian particles. So if you want to model, model these things, it's very straightforward. Uh, if I look at overdam dynamics, we have that the velocity of the particle is controlled by external forces. So we have uh, the thermal noise from the environment, which is typically negligible for the dynamics of these things. Then the particles are polar, they have an arrow associated with them, and they're self-propelled in the direction of this arrow. So U is the direction of the arrow, so in two dimension, cosine theta, sine theta, and V is the magnitude of the velocity. And the direction of the arrow is dictated by some uh, a random process, which you can specify depending on the specific model. And then you add interactions between the particles. So uh, if you look at a single active particle, two very common uh, models are inspired by what I showed you before, active Brownian particles. So these are the guys which move, but this arrow diffuses about. So if you look at them, they move uh, run length, which is the velocity divided by the rotational diffusion coefficient. And after this length, they reorient. And on long time scales, it's very boring. They're just diffusing particles nothing exciting happening. And you can either calculate this diffusion coefficient or guess from dimensional analysis. Run and tumble particles, very similarly, they move in straight lines and with a rate alpha, they choose a new direction. And again, this run length is just the velocity here divided by the rate at which they reorient on a long time scales. Again, they're very, very boring. They just diffuse about, nothing exciting is happening. So alone boring, however, it was realized very quickly that once you let them interact either with external potential or with each other, they start to display a host of physical phenomena, which are very different than what we know from equilibrium. And indeed, depending on the details of the interactions between them, for example, you can find uh, many, many, many phases. The most famous is maybe the flocking phase of the Vichik model studied by uh, Tonel Tool, important contributions also by Sriram Almaswamy, active pneumatics, which display the low Reynolds number tool bullens. And there's a whole uh, zoo of interesting phenomena associated with these systems. <clears throat> so what I'm going to focus on this talk is what we call scalar active matter. I'm focusing on it because I like simple systems, and this is probably the simplest active system. And when we say scalar, it means that there's no coupling between the orientation. Can you see my my image on, or only my? Uh, no. Can you see my face and my hands? No, I can see your face and hand. Yeah, yeah, I can see your hand. Oh, you can see it. Okay, good. So there's no coupling between the orientational degrees of freedom. Okay, so, so this means that there's the, these scalar active systems, there's no long range order associated with the orientational degrees of freedom. So this is probably the simplest one. And despite that, it has an interesting non-trivial phase diagram. So the phase diagram for active matter, uh, 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 for this scalar active matter, takes the following form. If you go at uh, dilute densities, or if you want low activity, 
Uh, the system is, as you would guess, homogeneous. Particles don't see each other. And if you measure a two-point correlation function, it decays, it decays exponentially with some characteristic length scale. <clears throat> when you increase the density, that's when active systems become uh, interesting. You find out that the system undergoes uh, something that looks very much like a textbook uh, phase separation. So it goes, goes under phase separation. Goes, uh, it, it exhibits phase separation. And if you measure the two-point correlation function, it decays linearly with a scale that's dictated by the size of the macroscopic droplet, which grows with the system size. And the big surprise was that this system phase separates even if the active particles don't attract each other. So for example, in this movie, uh, the, we, I'm showing you simulations of active particles with, which interact with each other only through hardcore interactions. And nonetheless, they exhibit uh, phase separation. So it's very tempting to think that this is just an extension of the usual uh, phase separated state. However, if you take a system that's initial, you take a system with, say, some attractive interactions, uh, so that phase separates. So here I'm showing you numerics again of a system where V0 is equal to zero, it exhibits phase separation. And then I start cranking up the velocity of the active particles, cranking up V0. And you see that what the activity does, it initially destroys the phase separated state going into a homogeneous state. But then as you crank up the activity more, you flow into what people call motility induced phase separation. So I'm showing this movie just to stress that it really is a distinct phrase from usual phase separation. And its physics has been studied extensively in the last more almost 15 years. And it's understood that the instability that leads to MIPS is the fact that active particles, even when they collide with each other, then they slow each other down. And when active particles uh, are, in a, are moving slower, they tend to accumulate in those regions. So this mechanism was understood by Cates and Fayol. There is a nice review from already from 2015 explaining the mechanism. And this is a movie showing that indeed active particles accumulate uh, where they move slowly. So this is from the Leonardo, uh, Roberto di Leonardo lab in Rome. And what they do, they have a strain of bacteria which move slower where they're experiencing. Maybe there's a lag. I don't see the movie. Uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe into my internet. I haven't internet. run it yet. So it's... Okay, okay, okay. Sorry. Okay. So what they do is they have... Uh, uh, a strain of bacteria which slows down when it's subject to light. And what they do is they shine light and let the system relax to its steady state. And you can see that by shining different patterns of light, they can paint with the bacteria. And in, in fact, there are some people thinking about doing lithography uh, using these methods. Okay, so uh, so again, this phase transition is understood very well. Uh, it's understood so well that for some specific models, we can calculate analytically the binomial. And I'm not going to talk about it in this talk, just to sketch uh, the main idea. So what you do is you write down a continuity equation for the density. Because the polar degrees of freedom don't interact with each other, they decay very, very quickly. So the only slow mode in the system is the density. And then you write down the density much like you would do with model B dynamics. You have a mobility times a gradient of the chemical potential like quantity. There's another term that I'm not going to discuss, which doesn't matter for the discussion here. And the trick is that G, where in equilibrium it's equal to uh, a derivative of a free energy so that this is minimizing a free energy. Here we do a gradient expansion but we allow G not to be a full derivative, a functional derivative of a free energy. And that actually gives a constraint on, on these coefficients. <clears throat> and introducing these field, the and these field theories, sorry, uh, you can actually these days derive them uh, starting from uh, specific microscopic models by some uh, mean field and gradient, mean field approximations and gradient expansions. 
uh, and uh, they, they were first postulated by uh, in this paper phenomenologically just by adding this kpz like term uh, into a model b dynamics and in fact one can start with this equation of motion and uh, remarkably uh, build something that's the moral equivalent of a, of a, of a maxwell construction uh, which is something that we I did with colleagues, uh, Sandra Solon, Mike Cage, Julian Tayo, a few years back, and you can see that uh, you, it compares very, very favorably uh, with the numerics, again, for specific models where we can derive the form of this equation. But there's once you have this equation, we have a well-defined uh, formalism for calculating the binodals, and sort of the surprise is that by doing it smart change of variables, the, the system actually maps to an equilibrium system. <clears throat> okay, so just to summarize my introduction, I've discussed scalar active matter. I've shown that even repulsive interaction leads to phase separation. This is something that's, again, been studied very extensively in the field of active matter, and it's called motility-induced phase separation. And I'm going to refer to it later as a benchmark. And uh, many aspects are understood, uh, and uh, superficially, it's very similar to the textbook. I had, uh, I had a, uh, a small question in the previous sure. slide. So, uh, how do you, did you get the form of the free energy, that is zero, and how do you know that this term uh, will, will be physically relevant? So, sorry, can you repeat that, the question? Oh, I'm I'm saying that in the previous slides here, uh, you have given the form of zero, uh, and uh, zero. Okay, uh, zero. So, yeah. so uh, I haven't written it down. You have to start with a microscopic model and derive it, and this you can typically get by okay. a mean field calculation, okay. starting from the microscopic model, and this guy you do by just keeping the lowest gradient expansion. Remember, you're not we're not interested in the behavior at the critical point. We're actually interested in calculating the binodals far away from the critical point. So it's more similar to a Maxwell construction uh, uh, than what you're thinking about with a critical point. Okay. 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 So that's why the whole description uh, in the uh, first equation it is just a more like a continuity equation. When we are trying to pose the whole problem uh, uh, by keeping the all other currents. Uh, aside, right? Okay, so you just write the most, you know, you could write it from symmetries, you know, you could guess this guy uh, just by symmetries. You, you would have a row squared, a row cubed, a row to the fourth, uh, but really to calculate these guys, uh, oh. <clears throat> do this fit, you have to know more about this. Okay, 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 so, okay. okay thank you. <clears throat> okay. So, so this talk is not about that. This would just be a benchmark against which I'm going to test some of the, compare some of the things that I'm going to discuss. So I'm going to take scalar active matter. So we have interactions, for example, hardcore, and then we have our usual active uh, dynamics, the thermal noise and the active drive. And I'm going to add external disorder. And what I want to stress is that this is vanilla disorder. It's short range correlated, it's bounded, it's derived from a, conser it's a conserving uh, field, nothing funny. I'm not putting in, I'm not hiding anything in the disorder, meaning when I turn off the, when I turn off the activity, my system relaxes back to uh, an equilibrium system in the presence of potential disorder, which we understand for a very long time. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask two things. First, you subject an active system to bulk disorder and you ask, what, how is the system affected? And then I'm going to do something even that superficially looks very silly. I'm going to subject the system to boundary disorder. So in equilibrium systems, boundary disorder doesn't do anything. It's a sub, okay, I'm a bit exaggerating, but generally, it's a sub-extensive uh, correction to the free energy. It doesn't affect, affect the di phase diagram of the system. And what I'm going to show is that even in active systems, even this setup, which naively you would think is not important, 
uh, is, is, uh, shows very interesting behavior. Okay, so before telling you the results and how we derive them, I want to set the questions that we want to address. To address. So we go back to, we open a SADMEC textbook and we ask, what can we ask about the disorder system? So the first question is, you have a dilute system, you add disorder, what happens to the dilute phase? The second question is, I have an ordered phase, for example, the phase separated state. I add disorder, is the phase stable against the presence of disorder? Namely, can I have phase separation in the presence of disorder? And just to remind you what we know about equilibrium systems, that's my model when the activity is zero. So when we have bulk disorder, then we know that the correlations, you know, you put disorder and a disorder system, you expect the correlation to be short range. And indeed, it's a pretty simple calculation. You take a linear field theory, you add a quench disorder, you find out that the two point correlation in Fourier space is a Lorentzian squared. So correlations are short range. <clears throat> then there's a very famous uh, work from the 70s uh, by Imri and Ma, which argued that the lower critical dimension, the dimension below which the system is unstable to disorder, is two dimensions for scalar order parameters. And specifically, uh, in two dimensions, uh, phase separation is destroyed in the presence of disorder. And the trick, uh, the, the trick is basically comparing the contribution of disorder to the bulk, uh, to the bulk of, a do of the bulk of a domain to the surface tension. And that essentially balancing these things shows you which is more important. Then if I put boundary disorder on the system, so just take one boundary of the system, say a left one, and put disorder, oops, disorder only along this, the boundary, then it's well known that nothing happens. It's a sub-extensive correction to the free energy. The free energy doesn't care at all about the boundary, so I can ignore it. So boundary disorder does nothing for the dilute phase or uh, the existence of a uh, long range order. So uh, in what, uh, what the time that I have remaining, I'm going to show you this is very, very different for active systems. For bulk disorder, I'm going to show, first of all, that the structure factor uh, becomes scale-free even in the dilute phase. So we're used to having scale-free structures when we have interactions, for example, at critical points. And what I'm going to show that there's a very generic mechanism, very robust for creating parallel correlations even in dilute phases with no interactions between the active particles. Then I'm going to show that uh, the, the transition into uh, phase separation is very sensitive to the presence of disorder. And I'm going to argue that the phase separation is not stable to disorder in dimensions four and below. So in any real experiment asymptotically, we don't expect to see phase separation. And finally, because this is a non-equilibrium system, it can support currents. And I'm going to characterize the currents in the steady state. And I'm going to show that if you take a loop in the system, uh, then the variance of the current along this loop grows with the length of the loop. <clears throat> so this is just to illustrate the difference between equilibrium and non-equilibrium systems. If you have a non-equilibrium system, uh, which is phase separated and you add disorder, the phase separation is destroyed, but the pattern is this short, if you look at and you measure the correlations, they're very short range, what you would expect. If you take an active system, and you add disorder, you can see that you develop this fractal structure, uh, which is actually, as I'll argue, is frozen up to some fluctuations in space. Uh, and, and again, it's a very, very robust mechanism for getting uh, parallel correlations in, uh, in non-equilibrium systems. So, sorry, here I have one question yeah. here. So, how do you characterize the disorder? It's a random thing or? Yeah. Just random short range correlations bounded. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, I missed that problem. Okay, thanks. Vanilla disorder, like you would do usually. Okay, okay, thanks. Okay. 
and for so, any sorry i have one question for any strength of the disorder the phase separation goes away yeah so it's a uh, so asymptotically yes that's what i'm going to argue of course for finite systems you know there's always a crossover even okay. in equilibrium okay 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 but asymptotically yes okay okay then I'm going to uh, use the same tools that I'm going to uh, that I, I'm going to introduce to study bulk boundary disorders. Again, this is disorder only along the boundary of the system. And if you look at a system with only boundary disorder, so this is a density plot. Uh, this is a plot of the density in the system. And if you look and you're not very quick, careful, you see that there's some action uh, along the boundary, but nothing exciting happening in the bulk. But actually, if you zoom in, you find in you find that there are correlations which spread deep into the bulk of the system. And actually, I'm going to show that the correlations decay as a low, their shape is a Lorentzian. So they decay in magnitude as a parallel as you go away from the wall, but their extent grows with the distance from the wall. Similarly, if you look at the current, right, it's a non-equilibrium system, it can support currents. So here I'm plotting the current in the y direction. And if you don't look too carefully, you, you see that there's currents next to the boundary. But if you zoom in and look more carefully, something's stuck, okay, here, oops, sorry. If you zoom in, you notice that actually the boundary is creating eddies in the system, and the, the magnitude of the eddies decays with the distance from the wall, but they spread wider and wider as you move away from the wall. And the most, most striking is the fact that uh, uh, even though these effects decay into the boundary, you can ask what's the fate of the phase separated state here, the state which is wetting the wall, and what I'm going to argue that in dimensions three and below, boundary disorder alone ruins the phase separated state. So boundary disorder completely alters the phase diagram of the system. And this is just an illustration of what's happening. So this is again an equilibrium system, which is phase separated. We add boundary disorder, which is repulsive here, just to make it more dramatic. So it's a repulsive disorder. And you see that if you look carefully, it's a bit depleted next to the boundary, but it's still, as you would expect, phase separated. Boundaries don't affect uh, the system. However, if you take an active system and you turn on the boundary disorder, then the phase separation is destroyed and, the, and sort of the particles aggregate in these clumps next to the wall, which are broken. And we understand how to characterize uh, these clumps as I'll, why these clumps result as I'll explain later in the talk. Uh, so this is sorry. really important. Uh, I have a question. Yes. I have a question. This active disordered wall, this slide that you have, they don't look to me like completely disordered. It's not, I mean, I can st still see some patches. So is it possible that, I mean, you just have more fluctuations, but actually it is possible to have some long range disorder or it is absolutely ruled out that it doesn't. No, it's to... ruled out. It's ruled out, and we understand why these patches have the statistics that they have. Okay, so 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 these patches are of finite extent, and hopefully by the end of the talk you'll have a feeling for why they look like they do. So even if you scale up the system size, the si typical size of the patch does not scale with it. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Okay. 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 Thanks. And the correlations in the bulk are like in the disordered phase. Okay, like okay, in okay. the very like in a dilute system. And even if you crank up the activity or let's say the density, yeah. you never get it back. Yeah, never. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll try. Hopefully I'll get to it. Okay. At least you'll see the techniques that I use. Okay, so this is to us very important because this means that you can't ignore boundaries in active systems. Okay, so, so typically when people study active systems, they look at periodic systems or infinite systems. And this result implies that boundaries can have a dr dramatic effect on active systems. <clears throat> okay, 
So now I now you have shown you all my cards, you know the results, and I want to argue uh, for why how we get these results. And what I'm going to show you is a, a, a methodology that we've developed to tackle disorder in uh, active systems. It's a bit more subtle than what people usually do, uh, but I'll I'll try to explain it uh, slowly, at least for bulk disorder. So what I'm going to do to study bulk disorder first, and as I'm going to uh, first, look at one defect, one small speck of disorder inside an infinite system. So to localize, generally uh, ugly looking piece of uh, po po bump of potential disorder inside an infinite system. Then I'm going to use this result to study dilute systems. And then I'm going to use both these insights to say something about interacting systems. And once you understand the method that I've developed here, I'm going to apply it again for boundary disorder and derive all the results that I've mentioned before. Okay, so bulk disorder, and again, you can find all the details in this uh, manuscript. Okay, so again, as I said, the first thing I want to look at is one uh, uh, amorphous piece of potential inside an active system. So, I'm, so when I throw something, it's not going to look like a sphere. It's a general clump of disorder. And I've drawn it in this way just to make my discussion easier. As long as it's asymmetric, nothing is going to change. So we have an active system, and then we have this asymmetric potential in the middle. And we know for a very long time in non-equilibrium statistical mechanics that once we break time reversal symmetry and we couple this to a breaking of a spatial symmetry, here this asymmetric potential, it's really easy to generate currents. This is ratchet currents. So ratchet tells us that we have a non-equilibrium system, you have a spatial asymmetry, then you have a ratchet. And these systems, and for this potential, it's really easy to understand. If I have a particle with an arrow pointing to the left, it moves, hits the potential, slides and moves to the left, if I have a particle coming from the right, it gets stuck here, accumulates here, and pushes against the potential. So we expect a current from right to left. There's another, another neat way of thinking about it. Because the particles accumulate here and slide when they come from the right, then the active particles are exerting a net force on the potential inside the system. By Newton's third law, this potential is reacting back and exerting a force on the active fluid. So if I look at an active fluid uh, where, which has one localized uh, asymmetric piece of potential inside, it's, 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 it's uh, uh, exerting a force on the active particles. So if I look in the far field, I can sort of guess what's going on. The, the bump is pushing the particles, essentially acting like a pump. These particles are diffusing on large length scales. Remember, that's why they, uh, what I showed you. These particles on large length scale are essentially diffusing. So I put it in diffusion of particles, and then I put in a pump, and the pump is located in the origin. That's where my speck of disorder is. So again, the physics of this is just that an asymmetric potential is acting like a pump. It's exerting a force on a diffusive fluid. This is an equation that we know how to solve from electrostatics. So the density of particles here in two dimensions behaves like the potential of an electric dipole. So it decays like a power law as you move away from the pump. It's anisotropic. Uh, and it's anisotropic, as you might expect, because it's a pump that's pushing particles from one side to the other. And the current, current is again, it's diffusive, so you act with a gradient and uh, use the diffusion coefficient, and it's what you would guess. You're pushing the particles in the center, and they're going to look like the field of an electric dipole. Okay? So, all, so the important point of this uh, simple argument is that if you have a potential, unless it's spherically symmetric inside a, an active system, then in striking contrast to what you have in equilibrium where 
Uh, the potential is only disturbing a correlation length away from it. Uh, the density profile here, it's causing a power law modulation in the whole system. Uh, and so it, it, it causes a long range density and current fields because of the asymmetric potential. And that means that specifically, if I would write down the steady state, it would be a non-local function of the potential, even for dilute particles. So you can generalize this to any dimension. And again, the bottom, the bottom line is that an asymmetric potential acts like a pump. And you get that it, again, it decays like a power law, a dimensional dependent one. And again, I've only sketched the derivation here. Uh, we can actually start from microscopic equations and build up the multiple expansion and derive the re these results. And we can do it both for non-interacting particles that was initially done here, but actually we were able, Ronald Granek, which is a PhD student here, was able to actually generalize the calculation even when you have pairwise interactions between the active particles, which is a non-trivial calculation. As a side note, I want to say that so far I've discussed uh, a, 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 an asymmetric potential inside an active fluid. I said that it's like a pump inside a diffusing system, and that led us to a study a pump in a critical system. And we've just posted this a few weeks back. It's a different topic. I won't talk about it, but if you're interested, you can find uh, the paper here. Okay, so now again, asymmetric potential leads to this long wavelength, this long uh, uh, power law disturbance in the system. So I'm going to use that now to study uh, a disordered system. So I take my disorder system. So again, the idea is that we have my active particles, which are in interacting with some external noise, the active drive, and my disordered potential which again is vanilla, short range, bounded, nothing special about it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the previous result to analyze the dilute limit. So I put a bit of disorder in the system, it acts like a pump. I put more disorder in the system, it acts like another pump pointing in another direction. I put another uh, speck of disorder, and each of these specks is acting as a pump in a random direction, which depends on the microscopic realization of the disorder. Before proceeding, I want to say that this is this means that the particles are experience a random force by the pumps, which is pushing them in different directions. <clears throat> and in fact, random forcing has been uh, studied a lot in the 80s already uh, as a simple model for dynamics and disorder systems. And there's beautiful work by Bernard Derrida, and Daniel Fisher. And there already in 1990, there was a very nice review by Jean-Philippe Bouchot, uh, Pierre Le Dussal, and, uh, and others, which reviewed the physics. However, these were for single particle systems. And here, the active system, the notion of active system sort of brought up the interest in the many body generalization of that problem. Okay, so I take my result for a uh, uh, an asymmetric potential now localized at R prime. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that I have a random, uh, this field of dipoles is just randomly distributed in space. So again, the physical insight is that a random disorder potential translates into a pump, which is very different than equilibrium systems. And I'm going to draw the, these pumps from a random distribution. Slightly sloppy here because this is a force and this is a force density, doesn't matter. You do the calculation and you find out that the structure factor is one over Q squared. So it's a power law. And note that this is even in the dilute system. These pumps are pushing the particles in specific locations, creating the scale-free uh, structure. So this is uh, a simulation of what's happening. So we start with the disorder, we let it run. And you can see that it's evolving into the scale-free structure. It's fluctuating, but if you note, they're localized in specific locations in space. So the pumps are sort of directing the particles to stay in specific locations in space. And uh, what I'm showing below here 
it's just a confirmation that indeed in two dimensions, uh, the one over two squared translates into logarithmic correlations. And we indeed uh, verify this uh, simple theory using numerics. <clears throat> okay, so just to recap, the dilute system, you put in this order, you get these power law correlations. And now I'm interested to ask what do interactions do? Do they modify this? And uh, can I ask something? Can I get Hello, can I ask a question? Yeah. Sure, of course. Uh, in the previous slide, uh, where you introduced the concept of pump. Uh, this one, or before? The slide doesn't, the slide doesn't come up here. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, yeah, there is a bit of delay. I don't know oh, um, which side. So, yeah. So which slide you have to be more specific? Okay. Uh, so it's uh, uh, the second, uh, second slide. Yeah. Oh, the two, two slides two before. before. Last, last two slides. Yeah. This second last. So my question is, uh, like, uh, can the pump uh, push a particle? I mean, if uh, uh, opposite its uh, opposite of its orientation direction. I mean, so, 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 again, what, yeah. so what happens is that on average, mm -hmm. uh, what the pump is doing is it causing the particles. Okay, let me go back and show you this movie. Mm -hmm. Not the movie, sorry. Oh, sorry. Can't Just see let me know. Okay. Yeah, yeah okay. I think structures are frozen somehow. Okay, let me know when you can see. So now I am in this one localized deformation. No, actually nothing is moving, Yadiv. Yeah, yeah. We are stuck on the same slide. Which slide? Maybe you oh. can uh, stop presenting and then uh, again uh, reshare it. Okay. Okay, let me stop presenting. Okay, sorry. Okay. Can you see it now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so back to your question. If you look at what's happening, if you have a particle that's uh, hitting this potential, then what you notice that essentially it's being polarized by the potential. Okay, on average, of course, it's being polarized by the potential. So if you look far away from the pump and actually the, the polarization is actually related to the current, then it's actually effectively what this pump is doing is po polarizing these guys in its vicinity. Because if it comes, it slides and it's polarized in this direction. Here it comes, it's stuck, and it reorients, and it comes out, it's also pointing to the left edge. Okay, so what okay. that's something that's well known in active systems that potentials tend to polarize the active particles. Uh, I want to ask answer. one question, Yare. Sure. Yeah, so this is regarding this uh, polarization of particles. So whatever the structure factor you are showing, that is the density density structure factor, I guess. Yes. What about the yes, velocity exactly. or the orientation correlations with the? So in this system, it's. Uh, yeah, in this system, it's not very interesting because they reorient uh, much quicker. Uh, okay, there are correlations, they're much weaker because the, roughly speaking, the polarization goes like the gradient of the density. Okay, okay. 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 Thank you. So they're less interesting. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, other questions? Okay, so now I'm going to turn into interacting systems. And uh, the approach will be uh, to write down the simplest linear theories that we can imagine to describe this thing. And then I'm going to check when it's self-consistent. And sometimes you're lucky and you're self-consistent within the linear theory. So, okay, so I want to write down a field theoretical treat treatment for the disordered problem. So again, I have my conservation equation for the uh, phi, which is the deviation from the mean density here. And I start with the current, which is the simplest grad gradient of a chemical potential, what you know from the usual static 
uh, a, a book. It's just a, a linear a gradient of uh, of uh, you know the simplest uh, linear chemical potential that you could imagine. Uh, remember, all the activity came at the nonlinear term. And then I'm going to add the disordered potential. And uh, the crucial point is that instead of putting a, a potential in the free energy <clears throat> and then writing down this, this, or, this uh, disorder as a contribution to mu, we note that on large length scales, it actually translates to a forcing term. And that gives very, very different physics. I'm stressing this because I've seen some papers where they do the opposite. And then we take this forcing term and we draw it from a quenched random Gaussian distribution, which is uncorrelated in space. Okay, so this is a simple enough field theory. I can add to it, you know, just uh, random noise from thermal or whatever origin you want. Uh, to, general, this shouldn't be thermal, so it's some Gaussian noise from the dynamics, and you can look and calculate the two-point correlation function. It's a linear theory, so everything's very simple, and you find out this expression, and importantly, in the small q limit, I recover exactly the result of the dilute picture. So this means that the interactions, which are encoded in this k, actually lead to higher order corrections uh, to the, uh, to the uh, correlation function. So, so th th there's also a component in U, but anyway, so sorry, I wasn't very clear. Uh, at the end of the day, the important point is that, that in the small Q limit, you go into one over Q square. So it's natural to ask, why does this field theory give me a one over Q square uh, correlation? And, and, uh, and there's actually a, a, a neat way to see this. <clears throat> and to do this, what we do is use a Helmholtz decomposition. So I write down my field theory. So I remind you, I have my time derivative, derivative of the density is a minus a divergence of the current. And I have this current, which is just this linear field theory terms plus this random forcing. And what I do is I take this random forcing term and I, it's a vector, and I decompose it using a Helmholtz decomposition. And now the trick is that this guy has a divergent, which is zero, so it doesn't contribute to the dynamics of phi. So as far as phi, con, as phi is concerned, this guy is non-existent. The current, of course, is affected by this guy. But as far as phi is concerned, this, one, this guy doesn't exist. So I'm left with an effective equilibrium theory, but now with this potential whose statistics I can extract from the statistics of the random forcing. So you can do that, that's a straightforward exercise, and you find out that the two-point correlation of the random potential in Q space is one over Q squared. So essentially what we have is that these pumps are creating a potential, which is Gaussian surface, it's self-affine, and I look at larger and larger scales on this surface, I'm seeing wells which are deeper and deeper and deeper, and they're essentially just accumulating the particles inside these wells. So again, the pumps are creating this self-similar structure, and the particles, even without interactions, are just falling into these uh, traps. You can check how if the theory is self-consistent, and then again, you just check when the fluctuations are small. And what we find out is that in two dimensions, we expect the theory eventually to break down beyond a length scale. However, this length scale is exponential in the parameters of the model. And despite really, it wasn't me, but the team here did heroic efforts numerically to try and find something funny and they really couldn't find anything beyond the law correlation, correlations. And they really, you know, too, too much, uh, the carbon fit, footprint of the effort was uh, too large. Uh, and then uh, you can check for higher dimensions and we find out that for dimensions larger than two, 
For weak disorder, the theory is self-consistent. However, for strong disorder, uh, there could be a new phase, uh, which we don't know anything about. Uh, Yannick? Uh, yes. Uh, so how does activity enter here? So the important part of the activity in this work, in this theory, is that, let me go back, is that what, typically when you had a random potential, you add a term which is the, the potential here. Okay, so there's a gradient of the potential. However, here, using the insights from before, instead of just having a random potential, the activity translates the random potential into a random forcing. So the random potential acts like a pump. So the fact that I put here these random oh, I see. pumps is the important ingredient. So I could get exactly this. Oh, I see. So you are putting current by hand. So I mean, sort of. Well, using the disorder current, current, sort of current operator. Yeah, not really by hand. A bit better than uh, that, but yeah, no, uh, yeah, no, yeah. By hand is not the right one, but yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So okay. You're using the insights from before uh, to get this uh, pumps. Disorder pumps. Now, yeah. yeah. Now we're actually deriving the field theories in a more organized way. But the crucial thing is that when you see a random potential in an active system, don't put a random potential, put a random pump. Right, okay, thanks. Okay, okay let me run forward. Okay, so, uh, so next thing you could look at the currents inside the system. And, uh, and again, it's a straightforward uh, calculation with the sphere theory now that you understand that it, essentially you have random forcing, random pumps kicking it in different direction, then by central limit theorem, if you have a loop of length C, you expect the current whose variance grows with C, and this is indeed what we see from the numerics also. <clears throat> okay, the last thing you could do is ask how stable is long range uh, order to this thing. So you have uh, uh, the, now the disorder of potential, you do your run-of-the-mill Imri Ma argument because remember the linear order. It looks like uh, an equilibrium theory with a random, funny random potential, and you find out that the uh, uh, lower critical dimension is four, meaning that there's no phase separation below four dimensions. And here I'm just concluding this part by showing a movie where you have active particles and you crank up the disorder. And you see that you go from the space separated state into this self affined fractal structure. Okay, how, how much time do I have? Another 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay, so yeah. I'll just guide you. I'll, I'll, okay, I'll just guide you very, very quickly through the boundary disorder. And again, you can find more details here. So the approach is exactly what I described before. We start by looking at one localized potential disformation, but now we put a bump next to the wall. So we take a wall and we put a small potential bump on the wall, which is generally asymmetric. And technically it's harder because anyway, the technical reason is that these field, these theories, you can't use neither Drichlet boundary conditions or Neumann boundary conditions. So you have to be a bit more creative, but you can actually solve it and you get the result that you might guess without doing anything. You find out that there, this small bump acts like a pump, but the pump is now parallel to the direction of the wall. Okay, so this is what's encoded in this. So the pump is parallel to the wall and then the density modulations are essentially just, again, par law, anisotropic, the pump is pushing particles from the bottom to the top. So you have more particles here and less particle here. And because it's pushing it, we have currents which are flowing again, like fields of the dipole with the dipole which is parallel <coughs> to the wall. And again, we can do this both for the elute systems and with pairwise interactions. Now we uh, take the same idea and model a dilute system by just random pumps along the wall. So a disorder of potential is just random pumps which are oriented along the wall. 
And what you find out using, again, the same approach, is that the two-point correlation function is a Lorentzian. It decays with the distance from the wall, as one over the distance from the wall, roughly, but it spreads more as you more move further in the, in the perpendicular directions, as you move further and further away from the wall. So this is for equal values of x and different values of r parallel to the wall. And you can see the theory with our calculation, and it works beautifully. And this is, again, just to collapse, to show that everything collapsed as ex expected. And really, the picture is that now the wall, you see, before we had the, the disorder steering the fluid, and now, now we have steering, which is confined to the wall. And you can uh, use the, uh, a, oh, okay, and this is a comment I wanted to want to add that actually for this whole effect uh, to propagate into the bulk of the system, you actually have to have a disordered system. If you have a periodic system, you can show that the effects of the boundary are screened on a length scale, which is comparable to the length of the period of the uh, disorder. Okay, you can do the same thing for the current, again, the same theory, and you find out that the current uh, has, uh, uh, so at the, at the distance uh, x from the wall, the scale of the, uh, of the eddies which are created by the wall is x, uh, and, uh, and you can see that, again, they decay in scale, but their magnitude uh, is growing. And, uh, and again, now that we have, we have the dilute system, uh, we do the same trick as before. We take our linear field theory, we now add disorder, but now the disorder is only confined along the wall. Same idea as before. We do the linear theory with this now disorder along the boundary, and you do the calculation. You find out that the structure factor agrees with what we had before. You can check when the theory is self-consistent. This time we have to do just you know, the usual scaling to check which terms are important on large length scales. And we find out that the theory is good for any dimension larger than one. And, uh, and again, we draw this effective potential uh, and you find out that this effective potential has the statistics of this Lorentzian. So this goes back to Shakuntala's question from the beginning. So what's happening is that near the wall, okay, let me go to the figure. So near the wall, we have this effective potential which has large bump, large valleys and bumps along the wall. And essentially this potential is attracting these particles to fall inside these wells, but they're of finite ex extent. That's essentially the physics of the picture that you saw before. Okay, I, because I'm sort of, sort of running late and I want to leave a few minutes for questions, you can do a Imri Ma argument for uh, the stability of the phase separation and the presence of the wall. Uh, there, we do it in the paper in two ways. There's a neat way that's based on an old paper by Meran, where you calculate the roughness exponent of the interface. And at the end of the day, we find out that uh, below three dimension, uh, the system is unstable towards this order. And uh, just to summarize, this is a phase separated system which wets the wall. We add this order along the boundary, and you can see that again, you create these clumps. And more important, if you, if you go into the bulk of the system and you measure the two point correlation, you get exactly the result, the result that we calculate for, for the dilute system. This is, again, a movie similar to what I've shown before. We have a phase-separated system. We put this order along the walls. And what you can see, and again, just this order along the walls, that the, that the phase separation is destroyed, and you get these clumps. And again, the interpretation is that we have this effective potential, which becomes deeper and, and higher near the wall and decays in magnitude, but that's enough to sort of break below three dimensions, break the domains, and destroy the long-range order. So just uh, to summarize, maybe the most important uh, point of this thing is that this order, or effectively any asymmetric potential, essentially what it does, it steers 
steers the active system. You just can't treat it in field theories, et cetera, as an external potential. You have to put in the fact that it's pushing uh, the active fluid. This leads to generic long range correlations, which I think is a new mechanism for generating long range correlations, uh, even for dilute systems. And again, this means that the results hold for any dilute active system. So whatever theory of whatever active system you do in the dilute limit, it better agree with uh, what we've done. The lower critical dimension for motility induced phase separation is four for bulk disorder and it's three for boundary disorder, which again, to me, this is a much more striking result because it means that you can't ignore boundaries in active systems. You really have to worry about the specific boundaries that you have. They can actually modify the phase diagram. And uh, finally, there's a bunch of stuff that we've done on the one dimensional system, uh, which is summarized in this paper from uh, two years back uh, that you can look at uh, or ask me now. So thank you again for your time, and I'm happy to take uh, questions. Okay, thanks, Yeri, for your nice talk. So now uh, it's open for questions. So if you have more questions, so please feel free to ask. Uh, hi, hi, hello. Hi. I have a question. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah so you just. Uh, uh, you just showed that the uh, phase separation is destroyed uh, by. By the introduction of disorder, right? Yeah. So, so can one understand this uh, from the microscopic point of view? Like, uh, if there is no disorder, then uh, the, that is in the case of say random tumble particles. So there is a tra trapping event occurs. So and uh, how the disorder uh, plays a role? I mean here, I mean, uh, yeah. So, so, so again, on the microscopic scale, the important physics is that uh, the disorder is, you know, it's like somebody mixing up. The active fluid, but in random ways. So you see, you're you're making soup, and you have uh, hundreds of little spoons, each stirring it in a different direction. Uh, so you can imagine that it's very hard to maintain a phase separated state. Uh, you know, just take sand and start oh, mixing it; it would spread spread ev everywhere. So that's the central <laughs> physics that we have here. Nice, nice. Okay. Sir, can you go to the conclusion slide? To which one? Sir, conclusion. Yes, summary, sir. Uh, sir, what is the means yeah. of the lower critical dimension for MIPS if DC is equal to 3? Because, because I studied many people in that uh, the dimension 2. In that case, we also found that MIPS cannot understand of that DC is equal to 3, lower critical dimension. Well, you have to, well, again, to actually do this, you have to go through the Imli Ma argument. So essentially the idea is that you have an energy for the surface. Remember, it's an equilibrium system within the linear theory. So you have to, so you have a surface energy, and then you have an energy of the bulk, of the bulk, of the bulk of this, of this, and then you're interested, sorry, and then you're interested in the, uh, energy of this interface interface so what you do is you just do a rescaling so you rescale the, the coordinates and then the slab width increases and you take an exponent zeta for how the width of the interface grows and then you essentially what you're doing is you check how does the elastic energy change under the rescaling? How does this interfa interface energy change under the rescaling? And you balance them to get the roughness exponent of this interface. Because what determines this exponent is the balancing of these two energy between <coughs> the uh, external disorder potential and the surface energy. And then the trick is that when this roughness exponent becomes larger than one, this interface can't be stable because it means that it's growing faster than the width of the interface. So that's essentially the argument leading to the three dimensions. Okay, and there's another argument that you could do by assuming a droplet in the bulk of the system 
uh, which you can find in our paper. It's again, it's a very similar Imrima. You calculate the, the surface energy, you calculate the energy of a droplet that's somewhere inside the system. You look at the variance of the energy and you see who wins asymptotically the surface tension or the bulk disorder. Any other questions? Uh, okay, I have a question. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, um, so, uh, so, you have shown that uh, the particular effect of disorder in active system is a kind of a pump-like phenomenon, uh, forcing introduced in the system. So, uh, uh, so is it uh, 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 is it uh, similar for any kind of disorder that I introduce in the system? For equilibrium, uh, no. You know, not in equilibrium, in active, in active systems. Yeah, so, so just to, so we've also looked at the disorder in torques, and uh, that does a very, very similar thing. So if you allow for torques, it does the, exactly the same thing. Uh, yeah, the, uh, yeah, so, so the short answer is, uh, okay, let me, Sorry, I'm just recapping. If you have disorder only in the velocity of the active particles, uh, then the answer, strictly speaking, for non-interacting particles is no. Okay? But once you have disorder <clears throat> in the speed of the active particles and you add interactions, then the answer is, again, yes. Okay, so I give you probably an answer that's more complicated than what you wanted. Oh, 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 okay, man. I, uh, I somewhat uh, thinking that uh, the the strength of the, the disorder uh, must have some coupling with the uh, velocity of the active particle, uh, velocity of the active particle. Because if I introduce a very weak uh, weak disorder or something that is not affecting the in the uh, particles, then I shouldn't see any kind of phase separation or the, the, the breakdown of phase separation in the interacting uh, regime. So, so again, right. asymptotically, our arguments are sound. Going back to your question, let me just get to the, the correct slide that will illustrate this. Uh, so if you look at this result, then you notice that the yes. modulation of the density depends on this effective diffusion coefficient, yes. which is proportional to uh, V squared over alpha or the rotational diffusion coefficient. So definitely the activity enters here. Okay, okay. Okay, so the details of how strong the random forcing is depend on the activity. Okay. Okay, thanks. Any other questions from anybody? Okay, if not, here I have one. Uh, so uh, I just remember one paper by uh, I think Leboich and Derrida. Uh, so they have also studied similar system uh, like uh, pump in a symmetric exclusion process. Uh, can you comment on that? Uh, I mean, what are the similarities of that work to your work? Okay, so that you would have to go to one dimension. Right, right, yes, yes. And, and in fact, probably a better analogy. So if you look at a pump in a diffusive system, there's a paper which is almost 10 years old by Tridib, Satya, and David Mukamel. Where they uh -huh. Oh, I see. Driven bond in a diffusive system. Right. Indeed, the behavior is exactly the same. Ah, I see. As an asymmetric okay. object in an active system. Mm -hmm. And instead of talking with David, we came up with this question of what, what happens to a pump in a critical system. Right, right, right. That's right. what this new paper is about. Okay, okay, okay. Find okay. The details in the, in the archive. Right. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Uh, anybody else? Okay, so if not, uh, let us thank the speaker again uh, for a nice talk. Uh, and really thanks for agreeing to give a talk here. Okay, my pleasure. So thank you. So let us keep in touch. So it's an interesting yeah, talk. Yeah.